Hi. Good evening from India. Good morning from America. Uh, so nice. Yes, so nice. So good to see you. How are you doing? I'm better today. Oh. <laughs> it was a challenging week. We had some incidents. Um, our vehicle got totaled, but, you know, it resolved itself and you do what you have to do. I'm very much yeah. excited, dear. Uh, you know, know so many I things am from too. you. <laughs> <laughs> I hope to meet you in person. Yes, let's meet soon. Hello and welcome to WGF iTalks. Today I'm in talk with Ms. Deidre Mojonvi from United States. She is the CEO of her own law firm, Deidre R. Mo PC. During the interview, we would uh, delve into Ms. Mojonvi's uh, personal and professional passions, her inspirational life journey, her challenges, her dreams, her philosophies, and uh, about her awesome book, that is already making waves in the United States and beyond. Uh, so hello, Ms. John uh, How Hi, are you? how are you, Ms. Praveen? I'm well, thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you very if much. I'm also good, yeah. I just wanted to say thank you so much um, for making this possible for me to have this interview with the World Global Forum Leadership and Organization. And thank you in particularly for your intentionality uh, about making a difference in the world and engaging those people like myself um, who are concerned and determined to just want to make a difference in the world, no matter how big or how small. So thank you for your intentionality. Wonderful. Pleasure is all ours. It's, you know, it's a great pleasure to have you here. So we will move our conversation with a session of questions and answers. Uh, and my job would be to collect various colors and shades from your life and uh, I would try to paint a beautiful portrait of yours for our viewers. And our viewers seek inspiration from personal challenges and triumphs. Uh, so we would uh, definitely talk about what kept you to keep on uh, when times were tough. How did you keep uh, you, you winning and moving ahead? And what are the new destinations you are aiming for? Please. Great, so, great. Yeah. So my first question to is, you know, and I'm very much excited to talk to you. So let's start with the questions. So, you know, the first question is, uh, please tell us about yourself in your own words for our viewers. Well, I'm excited to talk to you too. And I hope to meet you one day in person. Okay. Definitely. Yes, sure. Uh, well, okay. So, uh, my name is Deirdre Moore jean -Bier. I'm a mother of two a wife to one, <laughs> an advocate for social change. Mm -hmm. I'm an author, a newly published author, and I'm a practicing attorney, right? Now, as an attorney, what I like to share with people is that I did not take your tra traditional approach to becoming an attorney, right? What I did was, um, as a single mother, I to one daughter, to one child. I worked for nine years at a corporation called TIAA CREF here in the States, in New York. And I worked as a commercial real estate paralegal. And I quit that job after nine years so, as a single mom because I really wanted to go to law school and become an attorney, right? Okay. And it wasn't an easy decision to make, right? But while attending law school, realizing that I had financial obligations and responsibilities to myself and my daughter, I needed to maintain and not disrupt her life so much. I had to secure three jobs. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate to secure three part-time jobs, all in varying law firms, whether, and I traversed uh, New York City from the east side to the west side every day, in addition to traveling to Queens County to go to law school and then returning home to the Bronx to mm -hmm go back to home, to home to pick up my daughter. And so I began my legal career as a public defender in the area of criminal law. 
And I worked serving what we call the indigent population, those who could not afford legal representation for whatever reasons, right? Okay. And so I worked as a public defender for nearly five years. And then I decided to quit that job because I really wanted to go out and start my own law firm. Love and it. it would be five years after that, that I started the law offices of Deirdre Armour PC. Okay. And I focus primarily in the areas of uh, matrimonial law, where I handle people's divorces. I focus on um, trust and estate matters, where I do wills and trust and help people to figure out what, they're, what they would like to do with their personal and, uh, items and assets at the time of their death. Mm -hmm. um, I also do the area of mental hygiene law, which is where I help people secure guardianships over some people in our vulnerable population who can't, for whatever reason, manage their personal needs or their financial affairs. And the last thing that I'll share is after 20 years of practicing law and being blessed and grateful for the opportunity to do that, I pivoted my career somehow to become a published author. I mean, you know, it was on June. 7th of 2022 that my first book from me to you the power of storytelling and its inherent generational wealth um, was published okay so thank you so much for asking those questions <laughs> great thank you so much you know it's so good to know that fighting all odds finally you know you are where today you are so yes really really yes. nice really nice thank, thank you very you. much uh so you are a practicing attorney in the United States and you are also the CEO of your own law firm, Deirdre R. Moore PC. I wish to ask you a special question as a general perception of attorneys for the common people is negative uh, in the sense that people would generally uh, tend to avoid them. However, uh, how do you uh, look at your profession? Um, have you been able to help and make the generally tedious uh, legal process easier for the common people, especially single mothers, college students, and uh, people in need? Thank you for that question. And so as I indicated, um, I started my legal career as a criminal defense attorney, um, helping people uh, in the indigent population uh, as a public defender. Um, my firm also provides pro bono services to okay. those who can't afford legal services. So depending on your financial circumstances, depending on your um, situation in life, mm -hmm. uh, there is room for my firm to take on cases where there is no expense to the client. Wow. Okay. And we also offer opportunities for interns to come through our office. Um, primarily they're high school students wow. and college graduates, but, um, and we also have a good segment of people over the years that are single moms or people who just, um, they're looking to fill their days while their children are in school and to identify, hone and develop some skill sets of office administrative type work. Um, so there's plenty of opportunities that we try to afford where we can um, to help people who otherwise wouldn't have opportunities to mm -hmm. work in an office or a law office in particular. Thank you for that. Oh, wow. I'm and then one the last thing. Here. Yes, please. There was one other thing I wanted to share uh -huh. when it speaks to the negative um, viewpoints that people have about attorneys. Mm -hmm. You know, oftentimes I share with my clients and people in general, there's a quote that I have. I say, Lawyer lawyering is what I do. It's not who I am. And that quote right there reminds me to be true to myself, because as you can appreciate, Hasina, you know, it's people always want to see you and are so comfortable in seeing you from their viewpoint, mm -hmm. their lens, without right. getting to know you. Right. You, you understand? Right. And for me, it's important for my clients and anyone who I really encounter to know that um, one, I'm not your traditional attorney. Two, I have no um, desire to get notches on my belt. I'm just trying to do the best that I can to help their situation so that they can move on with their lives. So lawyering is what I do. It's not who I am. Lovely. You know, you're really doing a noble job. These days, uh, I don't know how many people would be there to, uh, who would be ready to offer even services without, you know, the financial aspects. So it's, it's really great to know all those things which you have been doing. Really great. And all the best that, you know, that you can keep on keeping on and then you, you guys can really grow more and more and more. <laughs> Thank we'll you see. very we'll much see. for the Thank wonderful you. answer. Thank you. Thank you. You are a powerful storyteller. 
and you have created your own sphere of positive impact in the society uh, through your highly popular book titled From Me to You, The Power of Storytelling and Its Inherent Generational Wealth, an African-American story. It's uh, available in Amazon as a hardcover uh, at a very attractive price. Uh, so how did you come to write this amazing book? And how did your nine-year-old son, Justin, become your inspiration for this book? Oh, Hasina, thank you so much for that question. Um, what inspired me to write the book is leadership, friendship, and our youth, right? And it's through the story of our youth that I'll tell you, um, hopefully you'll see how leadership and um, friendship played a role in this inspiration. Uh -huh. So it was back in September of 2019 when Justin was actually eight years old oh. and he, he yeah. had occasion to um, participate in a program at his school okay. uh, called the Service Learning Club, where you go into the communities and you engage people in the communities and find out ways in which that you can help um, right. people who otherwise um, wouldn't have such help, right? Okay. So he went to, they took a class trip to a nursing home here in New York State. It's okay. called the Hebrew Home. Okay. And while at the Hebrew Home, he had occasion to engage a Holocaust survivor, oh. right? And so after engaging the Holocaust survivor and on the way back to the school bus, my son and his eight-year-old peer, who happens to be of Jewish descent, mm -hmm. they were engaging each other on the way to the school bus about the topic of the Holocaust, Holocaust and slavery. They oh. were sharing with each other what their families told them mm -hmm. about slavery and what my family told him about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And as my son is telling me this story, I said, oh my God, I was so inspired by the notion that you have eight-year-olds who are having organic conversations mm -hmm. about complex topics that adults don't have with each other, that See? being the Holocaust mm -hmm. and slavery. Mm -hmm. So later that evening, my son, as I'm getting him ready for bed, we're talking and he says, so mom, so, so, so what slavery, what exactly is slavery about? Oh, Hasina, I say this all the time. If I had on pearls, I would have broke them. If I was I sitting on a stool, yeah. I would have fell over because I was just taken yeah. aback by the nature of the question itself, right? right? Yeah. So we started talking and I gave him a little bit more information, but I told him I was going to make it a teachable moment for him, right? Mm -hmm. So what I did in the days to come was I started searching my resources, searching my mind. How am I going to approach this? And mm -hmm. How am I going to do it in a way that's not traumatic, traumatizing, right? right. And so I really couldn't find those materials that would narrate the story or package the story of this complex topic of slavery the way that I wanted to approach it with him and his peers. But then I remembered what a dear friend said. Her name is Edwidge Dottakot. And she came, I invited her to my son's school and she spoke to the third grade class, the entire third grade class. And she shared with them what it was that inspired her to write her first book, Crick Crack. Ooh, okay. And what inspired Edwidge Dottakot was a quote by Toni Morrison. And the quote reads, if there's a book you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, then oh. you must write it. Okay. And remember, I couldn't find the book that I wanted to, how, how I wanted to communicate this information, narrated the way I wanted it to be. So I remember with that quote, if there's a book you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. And that's how For Me To You was birthed. Oh, wow. Wonderful story. You know, and then really your eight year old, I, I said it, it's nine year. At that time, he was eight years old. And Yes, he was. Uh, yeah. he, he, he was yeah. eight years old. And I understand yeah. like, you know, how, how he inspired you, how he must have inspired you. I can really feel it. Yeah. And we yeah. wanted to validate his question. You know, we right. wanted to affirm him and let mm -hmm. him know that what he asked was very important. Definitely. And, and yes. it was also in line with what was going oh. on, um, oh. you know, in social, in the social justice world period. Right. But we wanted to make sure that he was affirmed and he, know, he knew that we heard him. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yes. That's very important. Yeah. Yeah. The, the book layer is very interesting. So, you know, can you please tell us uh, about it? about the layout. Thank you for that question. Um, so it's one book, but I say that it's written in three parts. Okay. And the first part is chapters one through three. And that's where I speak to the diversity of people, connecting the reader and our son to our family and friends that we have 
around the world. Okay. And there's some country spotlights where we um, celebrate at my son's school, we celebrate a particular country for a 30 day period. We talk about their traditions, their cuisines, their culture, their um, arts and books. And, 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 and so we did a lot of those programs um, and you'll see those um, laid out in the book. They're called country spotlights, right? right? So the second part of the book, which is chapters three through, I think about 13, that's where, oh my gosh, it covers the, his, it touches on the mm -hmm. historical moments ranging from exploration, colonization, the revolution, down through to the civil rights era, talking about reconstruction, talking about black codes, Jim Crow laws. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I try to just touch on the who, what, when, where, how, and why of that complex topic of slavery, just touching on different different sections of it. And then the book transition, oh, before we transition, also in chapter 13 in the civil rights section um, or chapter, there are what I like to say features of um, illustrations of some prominent 19th and 20th century um, um, uh, civil rights activists and oh. speaking to uh, quotes and affirmations of um, basically derived from what was happening at the time that they were alive and parts of their um, sharing parts of their lived experiences, right? And starting with Ida B. Wells and ending with the former President Barack Obama. My, oh. my, 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 my illustrator did a beautiful job in illustrating these images. Oh. So um, I hope people take oh. pleasure in that. And then the book transitions, the last part of the book. It transitions with the poem by Ralph Waldo Emerson, Be Not the Slave of Your Own Past. And to me, that poem really means go out and find yourself. Think of a body of water, ocean, and go out and swim far to the bully and um you know once you reach there as you're journeying there think of your history think of the historical moments think of your historical figures think of those folks who have been um an inspiration who paved the way for you to be here today. And also in the third part of the book are some positive affirmations um, because it's important that our children hear um, that they are loved, they are enough. You know, slavery is not uh, my burden to carry, positive right. affirmations like that, right? But there's also a section at that last part of the book which um, features some illustrations and quotes by some phenomenal people who shared phenomenal stories when they came, when they visited my son's school, um, okay. people like um, Edgewood Stata, she, wow. she allowed me to illustrate her and provided okay. some quotes. Um, Dr. Onika, um, uh, Dr. Onika Williams, um, she's a dear sister friend. She's a urologic surgeon and an award-winning author of at least eight children's books and more. Uh, we had Dr. Pamela C. V. Jolly. I consider her an international speaker and uh, an author. And then we had um, the legendary Calvin Hill, a National Football League player who allowed us to, allow me to illustrate him. And he also provided a very special quote in the book that really enca encapsulates what this book is really about. All right. Wow, great. So, um, yeah, so that's the book layout. So thank you for asking. <laughs> thank you so much for, you know, elaborating. That's really great. Our viewers would really like to know. And then obviously taking inspiration, they would like to read also. They would like to, you know, get one copy for themselves, definitely. You know, sounding well, so good. Yeah, sounding great. Thank you very much thank for you. your lovely answer. Uh, your, your book is not only for uh, Africans or Americans or African Americans. Uh, it is for the entire world. Uh, it focuses on multiple aspects of African American history and features, illustrations, and uh, short biographies uh, of the most prominent 19th and 20th century civil rights activists, centering their voices with quotes and affirmations um, anchored in the time in which uh, they lived. What positives can readers extract from your book? Who all should read your book? Well, thank you for that question as well. And I would like to say that for me to you is accessible. And it was important that I made the book accessible because I didn't want people to be distracted by the things that um, resulted from the um, difficult time or the egregious time that our ancestors lived. Um, and so it's also what I call, I say it's multi-generational. Um, multi um, it's well suited for young readers, um, adults, and people of varying ages. I think anyone, someone from seven years old, 18 years old, 28 years old, 38 years old, 88 years old, I think someone will walk away with an aha moment. 
oh, wow. of the information that's in here. It's also what I like to say is a multicultural. I say it's an African-American story, but with multicultural benefits. <laughs> because it's something that we can learn about each other by reading this book, uh, which I hope people will see the generational wealth of knowledge that's mm -hmm. here is priceless. Okay. Oh, wow. um, and the last part of the book, uh, the positive affirmations. Uh, I think I said before that there are statements like, I approve of myself, I'm special, uh, my parents are proud of me. And one of my favorites, again, is slavery is not my burden to carry. I think it's important that these positive affirmations are recited to our children um, as often as possible because it'll help them to um, be able to, at some point, repel the negative messages that they will be exposed to um, um, early in life, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it's crucial to receive these positive messages, if for no other reason, um, Hasina, it's to counteract the often and unsolicited negative messages and harmful viewpoints from many sources, uh, messages that serve to adversely affect primarily Black and Brown people, right? Um, right. It, it talks about, you know, uh, these messages that want to tell the children and people who they are and what their lives are worth, right? Yes. So yes. it's no longer about that. It's about positive affirmations and trying to ensure that our children um, can um, um, derive inspiration from the stories of their ancestors as well. So thank you for that. Yes. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, the entire world knows and accepts that uh, nations are built through collective efforts. Uh, you can't ignore women or a section of people based on their religion, caste, or color, or belief. Uh, still, history is you know, rife with the stories of discrimination, exploitation, and the resulting spread of negativities in the society and communities. Um, how can people around the world find positive solutions to such ignominious behavior of uh, some human beings towards other human beings? What must be done? Oh, wow. Wow. Let me just say this. There's a lot that can be done. And I do not profess, Hasina, to know or have all the solutions. But what I will say is that prayer does work. Oh. <laughs> Praying for people. Because there are some people, Hasina, who are unwilling to allow themselves, I should say, to learn or even consider a different viewpoint from their own even with the facts squarely in their faces. So I just pray for those folks, right? But then Hasina, education is so crucial, right? right. Uh, without a doubt, without education, um, which plays a role um, in helping to eradicate the unconscionable behavior of some people towards others, you know, um, I, I don't know if there's any other way that we can really um, help to eradicate uh, that, that conduct. And I also say to people, Hasina, I ask this question all the time, you know, how can one counteract the unconscious bias and bias conduct of others if one doesn't know the root cause of the problems, particularly as it relates to prejudices based on a person's race, right? right. How do you begin to address, solve, and find solutions for the many gaps and disparities that have been created due to the race-based caste system, which is the systemic you know, foundation of our imperfect nation here in America. People are drowning in the symptoms of racism, Hasina. Yes. Folks are trying to survive, notwithstanding the wealth gap, the income mm -hmm. gap, the housing gaps, the healthcare gaps, the education gaps. You know, They're trying to just survive, right? Um, and education is just crucial. And, and we must educate our children um, from a very young age about the concept of what I like to say is identity and self-worth, right? Because with, if you do that, um, well, let me say, this. there's an old adage that my grandmother used to say all the time. In order to know where you're going, you must know where you come from. Right. And a big part of knowing where you come from is knowing your history, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so as, you know, as for the part of the American history, uh, which speaks to the live, lived experiences of our ancestors, whether it's our indigenous population or about the enslaved Africans and their descendants, we must ensure that the younger generations are knowledgeable about the accurate information surrounding their histories, all right? Of, of, and especially of the once central institution of slavery here in our imperfect nation, right? right. And, and, and as it existed across the world, quite frankly, right? We must make sure that books like From Me to You, The Power of Storytelling and Its Inherent Generational Wealth. Oh, wow. <laughs> 
Okay. That's the Can I, yeah. You must make sure that, Probably. yes. Okay, I'll nice. like that. Yes, yes, definitely. Yes, I, I would make like to sure. Read. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, that we get this book in the hands of as many of our younger generations as possible, because Good. it touches on the who, what, when, where, how, and why of that complex topic of uh, <laughs> slavery in particular. And lastly, Hasina, I would like to share that here in America, unfortunately, um, and maybe in some other places as well, but certainly here, uh, our country is divided over the issue of upgrading the curricula in schools, right? Okay. A curricula that would tell the true story of how the enslaved Africans and their descendants have been abused and used to create the canvas for what is known as white privilege, right? right. A right. curricula that would share the history of how black people have consistently been denied opportunities after being exploited so ruthlessly. Right? Well, notwithstanding the agenda of others to keep this history out of school curriculums, Hasina, right. I share as often as I can. Parents, leaders, neighbors, family, and friends, we have an obligation to tell the stories of the enslaved Africans, the indigenous people, and their descendants anyway. There is inspiration and empowerment in the stories that are to be told about the enslaved Africans and the indigenous people as well. And these stories should be told regularly and accurately. And from me to you provides what I said earlier, a generational wealth of knowledge that I hope um, people would find to be priceless. Thank you so much. And Ms. John, we are as you know, so well said, uh, like, uh, as you said that uh, all the problems and solutions, like not problems, the solutions to the problems Everything comes through education only. So absolutely. Okay, yeah. Well, definitely it comes through education. Thank you so much for the wonderful answer. And Miss uh, John I, I, I will ask you uh, the next question as a fellow woman to highlight uh, our specific challenges, um, which uh, generally only we are able to understand. We have to fight double to make our own space, our own destiny, and our own successes. Has your experience been different? If yes or no, how? And uh, what ordinary or extraordinary did you do to make way for yourself and then to announce that you have arrived? Thank you for that question, Hasina. And I have to tell you, I kind of assume that our experiences are probably shared experiences as <laughs> professional women. <laughs> Okay. Definitely, and certainly, yes. as professional, <laughs> certainly as professional women of color. Okay. <laughs> right. I have a little joke that I say to people sometimes when I go to some of these events and other things, I don't know which person or which, which part of me of my diversity enters the room first. Oh. Is it my, is it my being a black woman or is it me oh. being a woman? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Whichever it is, I'm in the room. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Good one. What I will say. <laughs> is the last part of the question is interesting to me, Hasina, uh, where you say then to announce that you have arrived, right? What to me, when a person engages with the idea of finding himself or herself and in learning about their history, knowing who they are, embracing who they are, and coming to terms with their, fr with their frailties and imperfections, to me, there is no need to announce that you have arrived, right? Wow. You see, I learned a, I learned a long time ago uh, after navigating many spaces from the classroom to the boardrooms that if you don't have a healthy sense of self, meaning identity and self-worth, then you are destined to be distracted by the harmful viewpoints and conduct of others. And what I mean is this, I teach our son that we want him to know who he is and what his life is worth through the values that we instill in him, right? Right. And I oftentimes say this, and I found myself saying it more to people, that it's not always about um, confidence and self-esteem, right? As much as it is identity and self-worth. Because to me, when you have confidence and self-esteem and you're entering a space and you're entering a room, whatever, wherever it might be, that is your confidence and self-esteem is oftentimes gauged by the people in the room right. who will make you feel confident or not have um, high, high self-esteem. Mm -hmm. But for me, if you have that identity and self-worth, 
it doesn't matter the room you enter because you will naturally repel those negative messages, those unconscious bias conduct of others and things of that nature. So you need a healthy sense of all, but to me, the foundation is laid when you have that notion of identity and self-worth instilled in our children. Oh, wow, right? that's amazing. You know, that's amazing what so you said, that you don't have to analyze. Let me say, let me, please, please. Yeah. Let me add one more thing to that, okay? Please. So if I did anything to make a way for myself, I did the hard work of finding myself. Right. And a big Definitely. part of that process and journey is knowing your history. So thank Lovely. you. Sorry. Definitely. Thank you so much. And this was so good, you know, how confidently you said that there is no need to announce actually that you have arrived. <laughs> yes. You don't have to say a word. <laughs> right. Right. Yes. The world gets to know. Definitely. So nice. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Sure. Uh, Ms. John, here, please uh, tell us about your family. Uh, how important is family to you? Thank you for that question. Okay. Yes. I love what family is supposed to represent, Hasina. In an ideal world, that would be unconditional love, unwavering support, being nurturing, loving, caring, and having the ability at times to agree to disagree, right? Right. Well, sometimes people are not capable of giving you what you need emotionally, even mm -hmm. family members. Some families struggle to just put food on the table every night put clothing on the backs of their children, a decent pair of shoes on their feet or on their children's feet, mm -hmm. and to keep a roof over their heads, right? right? So in many of the households here in our imperfect nation, America, doing those things to me are like monumental moments, right? Periods of survival, okay? I say this because during my childhood, we were surrounded by people who were trying to survive, but due to the root causes of racism, they were drowning, Hasina, drowning in the symptoms of all the gaps and disparities created and embedded into almost every aspect of what it would take to survive in America. Mm -hmm. So whether it's the wealth gap, the education gap, the income gap, the housing gap, or the healthcare gap, they were drowning in those symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. right. So that has been the norm for my family for as long as I can remember. And unfortunately, not many family members understand how drowning in the symptoms of the root causes of racism can manifest itself within poor communities and create family dynamics that challenge the ideal family structure where unconditional love, unwavering support, being nurturing, loving, caring, and having the ability to agree, agree to disagree comes easy and with no penalty. So while family means the world to me and it's extremely important, I do believe that sometimes you must love people from a distance so that you can keep your peace of mind, so that you cannot be distracted by negative viewpoints that serve to interfere with your mission to accomplish your goals and dreams. So I love my family. My, my daughter is an adult. She lives in another state. Oh. Um, my son is a minor oh. and my husband is a phenomenal person. And I'm so appreciative and grateful for having um, just met someone like him. He is, you know, what you see is what you get from him, oh, you know? Wow, wow. And so um, family is very important, but at the same time, uh, we have to keep perspective of the fact that sometimes um, we oftentimes mirror the very thing that the majority, that we complain the majority is doing in our communities. Sometimes that's mirrored in our households. Because again, people don't know while they're drowning in these symptoms, right. um, they don't realize um, um, the history that will give them much perspective as to why these things happen, if that makes sense to you, you know? Oh, oh. So. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. You know, you keep such sweet feelings for your family. Thank you very much yes. for that answer yes. here. So, so uh, given a chance, if you had to change one thing from your past, uh, what would it be? Uh, how do you envision your future? And what are your dreams? Please. Oh, wow. That's a great question, Hasina. Where do you get these questions from? They're pretty on point. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. I just, okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks. You know, and good to know that you're appreciating. I, I just, you know, in between, I just got scared that maybe you didn't like or something. That's why you asked that where from you do, you know? You got those questions. Nope, this was this is great, one? and thank you. Okay, okay, I love <laughs> Thanks it. Thanks so right? much for it because I've done several. I've done several interviews, mm -hmm. um, and your questions are so organic 
Um, oh. um, and um, are touching on things that I didn't touch on in the other interviews for whatever reasons. But um, so I appreciate those as well. But, but I really do appreciate this one here. Okay? That's really this sweet of you. This is my first you. international That's... interview. Yeah. My yeah. first international interview of the Oh book. yeah, great. <laughs> great. So good to know about it. And you know, you're appreciating, you're being so much generous. Thank you so much for that. Actually, to tell you the truth, we have a very, very strong research team and then uh, then the content team, then editorial, then, you know, that I'm heading the editorial team, uh, being the editor-in-chief at World Growth Forums. So we, we do take All care right. of everyone's, you know, liking, disliking, and, you know, we, we do have a good research before we uh, hold any interview. So, so good to know well, that you like team, them. Thank you. Let your team know that I appreciate them as well. And they're yeah, definitely, okay. definitely I'll pass on. Yes, thank you okay. so much. Okay. Yes. So that question, um, um, let me just say, I wouldn't change a thing about myself, Hasina. okay? okay? Uh, my past is a part of the total sum of who I am today, right? Okay. right. And there's a quote in my book, um, From Me to You, which reads, uh, knowledge of one's history mm -hmm. creates a platform to successfully engage the present and the future. Right. And that quote was submitted by the legendary Calvin Hill. Mm -hmm. And I so appreciate it because at the time he submitted that quote, he hadn't read my book, but that oh. quote is so apropos for what this book is about, right? Okay. And okay. let me just say, because I know my history, I'm able to embrace who I am. All right. Because I know who I am, I'm able to talk about my journey to becoming an attorney, an author, a motivational speaker without concern for judgment from others, right? right? Because I don't shy away from setting goals, I can also claim my future and go after whatever goals I set for myself, mm -hmm. knowing that it will take sacrifice, dedication and discipline and a whole lot of faith knowing that what God has ordained for me, no man can annul. So my dream is to continue evolving into the person that I want to be. And that evolution, Hasina, requires that I take the sum whole of myself and keep moving forward. Yeah. And well, what I would change if I had to change anything, I would say, is that I wouldn't waste time trying to control things I had no control over, I should say. Other than that, I wouldn't change a thing. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So nice answer. And uh, so, uh, Ms. Olivia, there was a time when you were doing three jobs in the New York City, simultaneously attending law school full time while taking care of your daughter as a single mother, what kept you to keep on? Oh my goodness, what a great question. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'll have to spend some time here on this one here. Yes, please. please. Bear with me. <laughs> please, please, please. You know, I'm enjoying so much, please. Okay, great, great. Okay, what kept me to keep on? Wow. Well, quite frankly, it was in knowing, hmm, how do I say that? Uh, it was knowing the history of the enslaved Africans and their descendants. I learned from an early age, Hasina, that our ancestors gave of their blood, sweat, tears, and lives lost, right? Yeah. To create the life for us to be free physically, mentally, and emotionally, right? Mm -hmm. I drew down strength, inspiration, and encouragement in knowing and reminding myself that my ancestors did a lot more with a lot less. So as I'm going through my journey and struggles, I kept that in the back of my mind and that mm -hmm. kept pushing me forward. And in my book, From Me to You, I touch on those historical moments and the lived experiences of some historical figures, right? Because our children, Hasina, they need to know about these historical moments that create the lens by which the enslaved Africans and their descendants have been viewed for more than 400 years. So I share in the book and I share in my presentations that our children need to know, especially our black and brown children, that our ancestors are part of the largest population of forced migration in the world. Yes, our ancestors were snatched up, kidnapped, brutalized, subjected to psychological warfare, and forcibly removed from their homelands, stripped of their cultural connectedness, and dispersed throughout various parts of the world, never to see their families again, right? Our ancestors who from here in America, in our imperfect nation, from 1619 to 1865, endured about 246 years of cultural negation as they lived in a society that at every step of the way, 
I have to say, okay, engaged in racial segregation, discriminatory practices, psychological warfare, and consistently tried to dehumanize us to the world. Our ancestors, who as of 1865, in the face of inalienable rights bestowed upon them as freed men and women, they remained subject to repressive and oppressive laws, such as the Black Codes and the Jim Crow laws, laws that continued the practice of exploiting, oppressing, segregating, killing, and devaluing Black lives, right? They need to know, Hasina, that we are from a populace of people upon whose backs empires have been built multi-billion dollar, dare I say, trillion dollar economies maintained and sustained, largely off the sweat equity of the men, women, and children of the indigenous population and the enslaved Africans and their descendants. Our children need to know about the lived experiences of many of these prominent um, historical figures of people like Mary McLeod Bethune, uh, Marcus Garvey, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, Barbara Jordan, just to name a few of them, right? And let me just touch on a, about just two or three of them. Yes, Mary please. McLeod Bethune. I need our son to know that she was born in 1875 in the heart of the Jim Crow era, right? He needs to know that what led to and how was it possible that in 1904, she was able to start a school for black children, all right, at the age of 29. He needs to know how was it possible that in 1935, at the age of 60, if I do my math correctly, that she started one of the first national coalition of um, African-American women's organizations called the National Council of Negro Women, which is still in existence today. I want him to know and to ask the questions, where did she get the courage, strength, and the fortitude to create this amazing organization whose mission is to advance the opportunities and the equality of life for African-American women, their families, and the communities. And that mission is still being honored today, right? Mm -hmm. He needs to know about Marcus Garvey, born in 1887. He died at the age of about 52, a very young age of 52. Political activist, publisher, journalist, entrepreneur, what led to his famous quote that he that we that we read so often? His quote was, um, "A people without the knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. You don't grow, right?" I need him to understand why did Marcus Garvey make that statement back in or about 1890s or early 1900s when that statement was made. He needs to know about Fannie Lou Hamer. Born in 1917, she was a voting rights activist. She died at the young age of 60, a young person as well, right? And she was a civil, she was a civil rights leader. Why did she say, and I love these two quotes because it reminds me of my grandmother at times, it's my late grandmother. Why did Fannie Lou Hamer say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired? And why does she always make a point to point out, forget what hurt you, but never forget what it taught you? But more importantly, Hasina, or just as important, why are we still saying and using? Why are those quotes applicable today? Why am I still sick and tired of being sick and tired of the injustices, the inequities, the um, um, issues that are going on that are stemming from, okay, yeah. the root causes of racism in yeah. our country around the world as well? Why, right, in 2022, right? And then you see in learning about the respective stories I should say, of these historical figures and others, our youth will undoubtedly, Hasina, come to understand, respect, and appreciate what was done in the fight against injustice and inequality mm -hmm. and what was done for our, be our, our benefit, basically, right? Mm -hmm. I remind folks also that we have not come that far where we can afford to abandon those stories, lessons, dreams, and sacrifices that were made by our ancestors as they endured the most egregious time of our history. We mm -hmm. owe them so much more, Hasina. Mm -hmm. So thank you for asking that question and allowing me the time to respond. Definitely, you know, it is so nice to know about all these things and you're, you're uh, so uh, vocal about all these things, you know, it's, it's great. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's so nice to know thank about you. everything. Thank you. Uh, so some people believe that uh, perfection is mandatory for success. Like, I love my imperfections and I feel that <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah, I'm able to have uh, more fun uh, due to my imperfections. How do you feel about yourself, your perfections and imperfections? And 
how do you relate the need for perfections with success great question <laughs> again <laughs> <laughs> thank you oh, thank you so when i when I, when i hear this question about perfections and imperfections i think of the fact that my son um um, he just graduated from the fifth grade. Okay. So he'll be moving on from elementary school and starting middle school in a oh. couple of days, oh, I think, wow. right? Okay. And so as a part of his graduation gift, okay. um, they gave them what, not a yearbook, but a memory book, right? Okay. Okay. And in the memory book, there are dedication pages and okay. they wanted the children's parents to, along with the children, incorporate quotes that okay. you want to put in the book. Okay. And I gave two quotes. Okay. And uh, my two quotes were, one, remember the golden rule, which I call a platinum rule, the mm -hmm. golden rule of do unto others that you will have done unto you, number one. Uh -huh. And number two, I just want you to be in life unapologetically imperfect. Wow. Right? So those are the yeah. quotes that I left in his book, right? So hopefully he'll look back on them and as the decades um, from now, and he'll remember to be unapologetically imperfect because trying to be perfect to me can take a tremendous toll um, on one emotionally, mentally, and consequently, it could, it could be damaging to them physically as well, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to be perfect creates this unhealthy competition, right? right. And to be imperfect, as you said, um, you can have fun with being imperfect, right? right? It almost guarantees that you will be successful in whatever you do or whatever you put your mind to, mm -hmm. because you'll learn from your mistakes. You'll Definitely. tweak them where necessary and go after your goals and dreams again and again. So if you don't make mistakes, Hasina, right, here and again, you know, now and then, how will one learn? Be the malleable and infallible human beings that we were intended to be. Without it, where is the opportunity to grow and there's no room to have fun? Right, right. So be unapologetically imperfect. Yes, yes, definitely. I would, I would say you never make a mistake. You always learn. And, you know, I must say that- Everything I, happens I, for a reason. Right, right. And an opportunity must, to grow. Definitely, definitely. And I must say that uh, I loved your, both your, you know, platinum rules. They were really nice. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Uh, so now towards the end, because we are, you know, maybe finishing this interview. So probably this yep. is, yeah, yeah. This is my last question, which I set for you, please. Please share your message for the youth and women worldwide. Who might uh, you know pick uh, threads of in inspiration from your life story and um, weave their own success stories in the future? Great, 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 great. So, um, quite frankly, first I would point out to everyone of any age: remember that quote that was shared with the third graders and with myself from Edgewood Dattakai. And as she quoted Toni Morrison, and it was, if there's a book you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. I was inspired by that same quote. And that's how my book From Me to You was birthed, right? Okay. But who knows what will be inspired? Who knows what you will be inspired by or mm -hmm. inspired to write, I should say, one day, all right? Mm -hmm. So be inspired by the fact that um, I sometimes say to people, be afraid, but do it anyway. Right. So if there's stories you want to tell or mm -hmm. goals you want to identify and move towards creating and working towards, do it, go for it, right? And then remember, um, when you find yourself in need of emotional support, encouragement and inspiration, as you pursue your goals and dreams, look at the frame of reference found in our book. I like to say our book, From Me to You, right? Mm -hmm. The Power of Storytelling and Its Inherent Generational Wealth. And draw down from the inspiring stories of some phenomenal people who gave up their lives so that we can have civil rights and justice for all, right? And remember, in most cases, they did a lot more with a lot less. So I'll close with saying this, Lucina. I like to tell people or say to people, Find your VIP status and find it quickly. And what I mean is, and I say, find your VIP status and use it for the betterment of your communities locally and globally. And that means find your voice, your identity and purpose. Oh. And don't be afraid to use it for the good of yourself and others. Great. Thank you so much, Asina, for having me. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Amazing. You know, it's actually, it's always great to talk to another uh, strong fellow woman and, you know, getting to know about their uh, inspirational life journey, then uh, taking lessons from them, learning, you know, things, getting to know about things, getting to learn so many things. Thank you very much for talking to us. Ms. Javier, you are a true fighter. You know, you are awesome. I feel great uh, having talked to you. Uh, uh, you are full of energy and dreams. I'm sure that uh, there are a lot more exciting successes just uh, waiting to happen. You know, so I wish you all the best. I wish you all the best. And all of us here at World Growth Forum's team wish you all the best, actually. All of us wish you all, all the best. And your life Mr. journey. Parvin, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate speaking with you and you yeah. taking the time to meet with me and all the wonderful things that you're doing, as I've seen in your magazines mm -hmm. and other things. So thank you so much for what you do. Thanks okay. a lot. Pleasure is all ours. Actually, you know, your life journey and your books, uh, the current and the future ones, will show light to countless people uh, to have faith uh, in their abilities and uh, move and move ahead to realize uh, their dreams. So. No. Yeah. Thank you very much for talking to World Group Forums. Have a wonderful time. Thank you so much. You too. God bless. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.